Good morning to you all. Um, thank you to uh, Dr. Singhal first for inviting me today to your wonderful city. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing more and more of it over the coming couple of days, but obviously in between the lectures. I've been asked to talk to you about the challenges in pancreas minimally invasive surgical training, um, which might seem an odd topic, uh, particularly with a lot of clinical stuff around it, but I will hope to, to share with you my thoughts and indeed the thoughts of, of, of Manny and the UEMS and, and others uh, with regard to the necessity that we do approach it in a modern way. First, my disclosures. Um, I have uh, links with both Merck Sharp and Dome and Abbott Salve, but I won't be discussing any of their products today. So to commence, in terms of ordering your operation at home, we're not quite there yet. There's no app on my phone yet that will be able to do an appendicectomy or indeed a necrosectomy for me, but we're not probably far off. In any training lecture, you'd be very familiar with people talking about how we can learn from other industries, and I have the obligatory aviation slide in early, but I promise you it's the only one. Uh, there'll be no more mentions of pilots or pilot training. However, we do need to, to get some information from other high-risk industries to, to see really where we are in our surgical training spectrum. So briefly this morning, I'm just going to discuss the vista of surgical training with special relevance to hepatopancreatic obiliary surgery, but also briefly discuss the perils of MIS strategies in surgical oncology and perhaps a touch on where we've learned from other disease sites. And then obviously the promise of technology will be forefront. So you'll all be aware in the last decade or so, there has been significant advances in what we understand about surgical training. And it's equally applicable for gastroenterology training as well. We're more aware of what, what the various roles that are uh, important in uh, competent doctors, both by work early in the Canadian colleges, but also now across the world. And we're also aware of the complexities around crew resource management in so-called high-risk industries, such as nuclear industry and indeed our own. There are, however, significant pressures, pressures that weren't perhaps seen in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where, where training was, 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 was more streamlined. Now, not only do we have a rapid advance in technologies, but we also have in various different districts a fashion or a trend towards working time limitations. I'm not sure if they apply here in Dubai, but certainly across Europe and across the United States and indeed Canada, we're seeing society not accepting the previous work-life balances in our surgical trainees. So we're having to face a surgical trainee who is spending less time at the coal face, so to speak, less time with patients, less time in the operating theater. Almost in attention to this, we also have increased societal expectation regarding outcomes. Gone are the days where it is acceptable to do an operation where there's a 10% or more mortality rate. We now are searching for operations that have mortality rates near zero. And these are operations that frequently might have been associated with significantly more um, than, than that. The other tension is the more for the change in training. Certainly in the UK and Ireland, where I trained, we were very, very um, uh, in, uh, inbred in terms of how long it takes to train. Frequently, it would take 15 years plus to go from freshly qualified doctor to consulting or attending surgeon. And this is no longer acceptable, no longer acceptable by society, no longer acceptable by the healthcare funders but also no longer acceptable by the surgical trainees. We have to streamline care. And the UK followed a, a North American model fairly early on in streamlining their care. And, and Ireland has, has, has recently followed suit. In this streamlined uh, training pathways, we have to have developed adjuncts. And significant adjuncts have been developed over recent times. They've largely based around simulation, ranging from low to high fidelity simulation, mimicking what the trainee will be seeing in the operating theater, or mimicking um, uh, environments whereby they will learn without actually being in front of the patient. One such project that is str strongly supported by the UMS and my August uh, speaking colleagues, Professor Papalos and uh, Professor Bergensfeld, 
uh, is the NASCI project. And you, you may not have heard of this because it's relatively new. Only in the last couple of years was it incepted and um, uh, put together by the UMS. It's a multidisciplinary joint committee whereby surgical uh, skills centers could be networked. And it started as such. It was a surgical endeavor, and it was born out of the division of, of general surgery. However, now it spans across many different divisions in the UEMS, and it is a fantastic um, potential opportunity for us to network our clinical skills centers, not only for surgery, but also for anesthesia, for pediatrics, for cardiology, and the list is growing almost day, uh, uh, daily. NASCI was formed last year and has already accredited six centers across Europe. And we look to see that improving over time. And really, that is one of the most exciting developments in networking clinical skills training across Europe in recent times. It is very important that we have such networks, because what we are seeing and what we have seen in the past is the way that we bring on new surgical technologies is perhaps not as scientific as we would like it to be. If I develop a new drug tomorrow, I will go through a very complex process with lots of checks and balances to make sure that I'm not introducing a new medication that is going to be harmful to my patients. Those processes are not in place for surgical technologies. I can start a new surgical technology on my patient cohort tomorrow, providing that the implements that I use have got CE marks or some form of quality assurance marks, yet maybe they may not have the outcomes uh, or the uh, clinical uh, data to support this. And we really learned a lot from the uh, port site metastasis story that we saw, particularly in the colorectal MIS history. You'll all remember the, the 90s when MIS was really taking off in more intermediate and complex procedures. And in surgical oncology, we were seeing these port site metastases, even in very early stage uh, cancers, Dukes A, Dukes B cancers, we were seeing these potentially curable situations rendered incurable by wound site implantation in, in, in MIS strategies. And we looked long and hard as to why they were happening. And uh, ours and other groups at the time looked specifically into the, the, the human pathological and technology interface. We looked at the operative environment. And we saw that we were modulating that operative environment by the minimally invasive strategy. Yes, we were getting good um, back-end uh, um, improvements in that we were getting our patients out. We were getting our patients physiologically returned to normal quicker than perhaps with the open uh, uh, procedures. But we were modulating the, the environment that we operated in. We modulated what we were operating in. It wasn't uh, room air. It was a hypoxic acidic gas, CO2. We were changing the temperature inside the abdomen. We were also changing the humidity levels and indeed the pressure. And all this had effect on the patient tumor interface. And perhaps any spilled cells during those procedures were more invasive. They were more capable of implanting and growing. And certainly I and others showed that if you had a spilled tumor cell model, when you compared control and the ability for those cells to be invading across normal humidity normal pressure and normal gases, you were seeing a baseline level of, of, of invasion. But as you can see represented by the black circles, there was an, an increased amount if you used a helium pneumoperitoneum and a significantly increased amount if you used a hypoxic acidic pneumoperitoneum such as carbon dioxide. And I think we all agree that the learning curve for MIS in colorectal cancer was certainly um, a, an issue in the port site implantation rate. We just don't see it anymore now with proper structured training models. However, we're just entering that where, with widespread acceptance of laparoscopic strategies for pancreas and for other uh, um, uh, surgical types, which may even be more difficult than colorectal. And we need to be really careful about how we bring these things to bear. So in that, with that, that care in mind, we also want to talk about the promise of technology. I, like most people in this room, quite like technology. It helps me in my day-to-day -day work. It certainly gets me on top of my emails from early in the morning to late at night. But in terms of pancreas MIS, we need to be especially careful. 
We, do, we not only have the, the difficulties and the technical challenges that we have of intermediate to high grade um, MIS strategy, but also specifically related to pancreas. The visualization of the retroperitoneum laparoscopically is difficult. The reliance on haptic feedback for dissection is never more important than if we're taking out pancreas adenocarcinoma. And the complexity then, once we've taken it out, of the reconstruction is perhaps a significantly higher grade than what perhaps we're seeing in basic colorectal procedures. So although laparoscopic whipple and laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy will now become more and more prevalent, we need to take care, and we need to, to take care in how we do these techniques over time. A lot of centers now for distal pancreas tumors are default laparoscopic. We haven't seen the explosion that we saw in wound implantation rates for these, but perhaps this is still a numerator and denominator issue, and it's something that we need to be careful of. Yeah. Robotic and master-slave manipulator techniques are coming to the fore. They're not yet universally useful in terms of cost and in terms of reproducibility, but I'm sure with further generations, not just HD generations, but further generations of da Vinci systems and other systems, we will be seeing them more and more used rather than less and less used. And they no, in no doubt give us an extra layer of uh, safety and an extra layer of complexity reduction in doing our difficult procedures, particularly in the, ref, uh, in the retroperitoneum. We have a very good restoration of the visual quality, but also we have a very good restoration of the control, a control that is perhaps lost sometimes with laparoscopic surgery. The one deficit at the moment is haptic feedback, is the force feedback where when we're actually feeling the tissues, we're not getting any, any feedback to the robotic operator. And when we are performing robotic surgery, that is one of the, the early learning curves that we go through, is to use the tissue deformation rather than the haptic feedback to work out that we may be perhaps t tugging the tissues too strong. It has significant extra benefits, though, not only in terms of control of the vision, but also intuitive control of the seven degrees of, of freedom that we have inside the abdomen. We have two little hands inside the abdomen, and this may be the single most important development to allow us to safely proceed on retroperitoneal surgery for more and more advanced conditions in the future. That advancement, though, needs to be coupled with a similar advancement with training methodology. Our old style way of looking at a trainee and, and rendering them or deciding them competent based on logbook exp explanations and uh, investigations is no longer relevant. We must ensure that they are competent. Gone are the days that we can say, if they train for X amount of years, they are trained. We need to have measures, not just knowledge-based measures, which uh, the UMS and others are very good at, but also we need to have measures to define competence. And with these master-slave manipulators, with these advanced laparoscopic kits, we have a lot of data that can be derived from the actual procedures that trainees do. So what we need to move towards is a training to competence. We need to move towards uh, a, a area where we can define someone as competent, perhaps earlier than the training scheme suggests, but also identify those, those trainees who require longer Work in Imperial uh, that I was involved with a long time ago now, which has progressed significantly, used very basic uh, assessments. We were able to put hand trackers on, on, patient, on um, uh, trainees' hands and watch them do simple tasks and very simply build a construct model, which is where we were able to see the novices, we were able to see the intermediates, and we were able to see the so-called experts and their range and use then these trackers to define a, a, a trainee within this range. And that was certainly very useful, but unfortunately it reaches a plateau, it reaches a ceiling very quickly in what we can determine. So determining between a early stage resident versus a late stage resident might be easy for an intermediate task, but determining when a late stage resident is appropriate to transition into consultant practice is much more difficult using the basic models that we have today. 
Our group in, in Dublin have taken that a step further and we're now using functional MRI, a technique by which we can put surgeons through our MRI machine and watch them think about doing operations. We also, in our early work, have showed that actually by doing simple tasks, we can develop the same construct we did with the ICSAD motion tracker 10 years before. But this allows us to allow someone to go in and think about how they would do various aspects of a pancreatic oduodenectomy, for example. And that allows us to work out where they are. So as an assessment tool, it's very useful to determine a nodal point. And this is going to become more and more important as globalization of medicine continues on a bound, where we have doctors transitioning and moving between different healthcare districts on an almost daily basis. And the current method of assessing those doctors is to get a lot of paperwork from their home healthcare region and in some way, shape, or form make an informed decision based on that paperwork. What I see in the future being significant and important is being able to discriminate these specific nodal points where a surgeon in Dubai can transition in perhaps a weekend to being a surgeon in Dublin and back again and be able to determine that, that surgeon is of fit uh, quality to enter in at a specific either training level or indeed consultant level either in Dublin or Dubai. And that is going to form a significant amount of research over the next 10 years or so because we have trouble defining competence as it is, but we have even more trouble defining what's the international nodal point on which these surgeons can change. So in, in summary, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in minimally invasive strategies, we have a defined and expanding role in HPB. Because of the complexity of the surgery, we're probably a little bit behind where other sites such as colorectal surgery are. But we need to learn those lessons from the colorectal surgeons in how we bring forward our MIS strategies in pancreas surgery in particular. And with that, hand in hand, we need to make sure that our training methodology is fit for purpose. Thank you. from the floor or any comment, please. That NASCA widens its perspective to include clinical training centers because there is no body that is really doing this. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for that. Um, so the question was, um, for, for those just who didn't hear it, was should NASCA, which is a, a, the a network of, of accredited skill centers in Europe, which is a fledgling organization, should they accredit <coughs> the clinical training and I, I think it being a fledgling organization, that is perhaps not within the remit just at the moment. The clinical skills centers that we are accrediting and, and are going on to accredit are accrediting the, the, the buildings and the people within the buildings, but has no um, desire at this point in time to credit content. I think a large organization such as the UEMS has other uh, things in, in progress with, around that. Professor Papalos. If I may <coughs> a comment in answer to Professor Felice's question, the UMS is doing that since 1997. There is a very robust program for appraising training centers across all specialties. Uh, and this includes a very formal application and comprehensive application, following by an on-site visit and scoring in more than 25 domains. And the currency is always activity, clinical and academic activity per trainee and then the center is accredited or not. And at the last uh, Management Council meeting of the UEMS, I introduced some updated guidelines about this, which are going to be approved in the next council meeting uh, in, um, uh, in April. Uh, and across the board, there are specialists, for example, like ophthalmology or gynecology doing this for uh, 15 years, and they accredit more than 20 centers a year. And others, other sections now and other specialties are picking up as well. So it's a very well-developed um, uh, project across the UEMS for many, many years now. <laughs>